Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's time once again for the Collins Brothers Unleashed with your host, Paul and Philip Collins. Hello, this is Paul and Philip Collins welcoming you to another episode. Last uh, time, Philip explored the dark side of the environmental movement and the power elite's use of, co- of concern over climate change and environmental degradation as a pretext for depopulation schemes. This week, we are going to build a little on that theme while moving into some new areas. We're going to place Canadian multi-billionaire and former Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Marie Strong, under a magnifying glass. His involvement in the environmentalist, environmentalist movement is important because he, like many other members of the global oligarchical establishment, appears to be using environmental alarmism as a means of fulfilling an elite agenda. Strong, like other members of the power elite, is a global mover and shaker that the majority of people have never even heard of. Mention his name to the common man on the street and you will receive one of many stock responses. Maurice who? Or what TV show was he on? These responses illustrate a common problem that exists today among the media-treated masses Unless a person has performed in front of Simon, Randy, Kara, and, and, and Ellen, Joe Average Citizen has no clue who, who he or she is. But Kelly Clarkson, Clay Aiken, Carrie Underwood, and the other starstruck boobs that populate everyone's favorite TV show do not even begin to wield the influence of power held by men like Strong. Strong's beginnings were anything but sinister. He was born on, in April. 1929 at Oak Lake, Manitoba, Canada, to a family that, like so many other families at the time, was hard hit by the Depression. Writing about Strong's youth, the Financial Post, Peter Foster states, quote, as a boy, he, Strong, ate dandelion and pigweed. He saw his father wrap his feet in rags before going out to the bush to cut wood. He saw his educated mother lose her mind to severe depression would be impossible not to be moved by such a tale, unquote. One would think that such an experience would make the youthful strong recognize the benefits of technology and infrastructure. His memory of the Depression, however, would have a different impact. In the September 1st, 1997 edition of the National Review magazine, Strong is quoted as saying, quote, The Great Depression left me, frankly, very radical. Strong spent much of his childhood questioning America's system of free enterprise, concluding that it was the reason for the harsh conditions of the Depression. This hostility increased when Strong went to high school and found himself under the supervision of a socialist principal. By age 14, Strong alleges to have skipped four grades and qualified for a university entrance. Whether this is true or not is debatable, however, given Strong's subscription to some of the more unscientific and questionable ecological disaster theories. It was at his, at this time that the teenage Strong became fascinated with nature and began spending time secluded in forest areas trying to learn about natural cycles. One can see the beginning of Strong's melding of, the, of environmentalism with socialism in these early experiences. Strong's socialist ideologies would come out later in life during a February 13, 1974 address at Iona College of Windsor. At that time, Strong had climbed the ranks of the world's elite to become the head of the United Nations Environment Program. Recall that Phil went into the United Nations position as an elite imagination during the uh, last program. We urge everybody to uh, go back and review that show. Strong used his new position to push socialist ideas. During the address, Strong lambasted the West for its, quote, preoccupation with the physical, the material, the quantitative aspects of our lives, an obsession with the notion that more is better in all things, the relentless application of purely economic criteria to decision-making has grossly distorted allocation of resources in favor of highest economic return rather than a, a, a social priority, unquote. He also called on America the developed nation, and, and the developed nations to have, quote, a much larger flow of resources between rich and poor countries with, the hev- with heavy em- emphasis on the provision of, ba- of basic s- social services to the poorest sectors, unquote. 
Strong then states that the elites, quote, form a secret society to bring about an economic collapse, unquote. At this point in the conversation, it was becoming apparent to Wood that Strong was casting himself and other members of the power elite as members of the proposed novel's secret society. Strong continued with his tale, quote, It's February. They're all at Davos. These aren't terrorists. They're world leaders. They have positioned themselves in the world's commodity and stock markets. They've engineered, uh, engineered using their access to stock exchanges and computers and gold supplies a panic. Then they prevent the world's stock markets from closing. They jam the gears. They hire mercenaries who hold the rest of the world's leaders at Davos as hostages. The market can't close. The rich countries, unquote. The quote then stops abruptly. According to Wood, at that point in the narrative, Strong, quote, makes a slight motion with his fingers as if he were flicking his cigarette butt out the window, unquote. Implicit in Strong's nonchalant finger play is, the, is that industrial civilization is destroyed in one fell swoop. And at that juncture, according to Wood, Strong realized he has shared too, he had shared too much of his megalomaniacal fantasy and stated, quote, I probably shouldn't be saying things like this, unquote. Then, the full gravity of Strong's tale finally hit Woods, and the journalist wrote, quote, I sit there spellbound. This is not any storyteller talking. This is Maurice Strong. He knows these world leaders. He is, in fact, co-chairman of the Council of the World Economic Forum. He sits at the fulcrum of power. He is in a position to do it, unquote. There is a distinct intertext shared between the narrative of Strong's Roman Enclave and the unfolding narrative of current events, the power elite's use of mercenaries in Strong's Davos conspiracy scenario is especially significant. Strong is a former, is a former co-founder, trustee, advisor, and vice president of the World Wildlife Fund, or WWF. In a November 5, 1997 article, and the De Groen Amsterdammer magazine entitled The World Nature Army, journalist Kevin Dowling revealed how WWF parks had become more of a refuge for mercenaries and private military forces than for endangered species. Dowling, Dowling stated, quote, I discovered that in the so-called wildlife parks a system of total repression existed. People don't have any rights. Their traditional way of income is forbidden. They can't even step on a flower without running the risk of being murdered. At the same time, those so-called wildlife parks turned out to function as staging grounds and training camps for all kinds of mercenaries. South Africa stationed its secret troops there, which had to, uh, to sow death and destruction in the, down the townships of South Africa and the frontline states, which, while also the terrorists of Renamo and Unida, liked to hide out there. Because I had so many contacts in Africa by that time, I was being overwhelmed with information about Project Block. I discovered that very heavy guys were involved in the operation. The military branch of the operation was under the command of Colonel N. Cook, the second man of the Special Forces in England, the SAS. Furthermore, in the Lock Network, I found the name of Gordon Shepard. That is a kind of dirty trick specialist of MI-16 who used to work in Northern Ireland. There were people of cruel associates, a private intelligence service of Wall Street. In short, it was a real heavy group, an old boy network in which the WWF, the SAS, MI-5, and MI-6, plus some CIA guys of private intelligence services brotherly came together. The civilian side of the operation was headed by John Hanks, Prince Bernard's right-hand man in Africa, unquote. Jay Wilkers expanded on Dowling's research in an article for a Dutch pu uh, publication. Wilkers wrote, quote, During that time, these people trained in a number of elite black units. That, uh, let me repeat that. During that time, these people trained a number of elite black units in the wildlife parks of the Peace Parks Foundation and the WWF. I have seen these pr 
project that, that these projects were completely financed by the worldwide fund for nature of course a certain france bernard has been involved in that who has walked around there with a suitcase full of money but the question remains how much this man knew about the projects it is known that in the past the, the, the sas units of the british army have been flown into south africa and were stationed on territory controlled by the WWF with the purpose of conducting military operations. Military units have been trained in these kind, uh, kinds of parks and were later brought in, con uh, brought in connection with murders in the South African townships. In the Zambezi Valley, members of the military wing of the ANC have been shot at, at from WWF helicopters. The Zambezi Valley was the primary entrance into South Africa. Under the cover of fighting poachers, ANC members have been executed without any form of trial. I call that an undeclared war or genocide. There are two types of parks, nature parks and strategic parks. The official purpose of the nature parks is the protection of nature. Often these parks contain important minerals like diamond or uranium. Locals are encouraged to leave or simply chased away. Type 2 are the strategic parks. If you look carefully, you'll find that these parks are either located on certain bridges useful for military observation, or they are border, they are border transcending parks, like, for example, those in South Africa and Mozambique. It is remarkable that corridor, corridors have been projected in such a way that they are cleverly combined, that they cleverly combine the preservation of nature with the gaining of a military advantage, unquote. These revelations make Strong's connections to the WWF even more disturbing. Strong and his co-conspirators in the power elite might be able to gain access to the mercenary forces necessary to tangibly enact the narrative of his Ramon Enclave. WWF parks would provide the resource pool for such a plot. Terrorism is yet another means by which industrialized modern society can be destroyed because of the destabilizing effect it has on civilization. For the power elite, terrorism is an instrument of societal reconfiguration that tears down the old order while simultaneously building a new one. Interestingly enough, Marie Strong is connected to an individual in the shadowy world of terrorism financing. Saudi billionaire and Iran Contra arms dealer Ad Adnan Khashoggi. Henry Lamb revealed the connection between Strong and Khashoggi in a January 1997 article entitled Marie Strong, The New Guy in Your Future. Lamb writes, quote, After establishing UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, Strong returned to Canada where he resumed the chairmanship of both Petrol Canada and IDRC, the International Development Research Center. He was introduced to Scott, to Scott Spiegler, who ran a Texas company called Pro Kemp Co. Strong's partnership, uh, uh, Stronet, bought, uh, bought Pro Kemp Co. and changed the name to Procore, which immediately entered into a complex $10 million deal to acquire ACL, also known as the Arizona Colorado Land Cattle Company. ACL's major stockholder was Adnan Khashoggi. In the end, ACL acquired Procore, but Strong landed in, the, in control of the conglomerate, which owned feedlots, land, gas, and oil interest, engineering firms, $200,000 and two hundred and 200,000 acres, which included the Baca Ranch in Colorado. It has been, a, unquote, it has been alleged that Khashoggi has actually done business with Al-Qaeda, the terrorist network established by Osama bin Laden. In May 1996, French intelligence secretly monitored a meeting of Saudi billionaires at Hotel Royale. The meeting, according to investigative journalist Greg Pearl of the last, uh, 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 u
of a, a, a catastrophe, an environmental catastrophe, and the measures taken to prevent that environmental catastrophe have actually led to another catastrophe that we might call demographic winter. We are now entering into a demographic winter. One of the first indications that the people bomb was fizzling out came in a 2001 article in Nature magazine entitled The End of Population Growth. In the article, uh, the authors concluded that there is, quote, around an 85% chance that the world's population will stop growing before the end of the century, unquote. Furthermore, the authors predicted that the coming population decline will pose, will, quote, pose major social and economic challenges, unquote. By 2004, the negative impact of the population implosion upon global economic, political, and social stability could no longer be ignored by national governments. David Francis describes the situation in an article that he wrote for the Christian Science Monitor. Quote, for decades, much has been written about the world's exploding population. But 60 countries, about a third of all nations, have fertility rates today below 2.1 children per woman, the number necessary to maintain a stable population. Half of those nations have levels of 1.5 or less. In Armenia, Italy, South Korea, and Japan, average fertility levels are now close to one child per, per woman. Very unforeseen change. At least 43 of these nations will have smaller populations in 2050 than they do today, unquote. Nations gov the governments, once eagerly involved in depopulation campaigns, are now desperately switching course and implementing measures that encourage procreation. Francis lists some of those measures, quote, Starting this year, France's government has been awarding mothers of each new baby 80, 800 euros, almost $1,000. In Italy, the government is giving mothers a second, uh, of a second child 1,000 euros. South Korea has expanded tax breaks for families with young children and is increasing support for daycare centers for working women. Last year, Parliament members in Singapore called on the government to do more to keep Cuban and the stork, the stork bin busy. Japanese prefectures have been organizing hiking trips and cruises for single people, dating programs to halt the bust, unquote. All of these pronatal measures were meant to prevent the baby dearth from having a serious effect on, economic, on the, the economic vitality, pension programs, and health care of the various nations involved in the demographic winter. Unfortunately, years of depopulation campaigns and eugenical regimentation carried out under the guise of reproductive rights have made some of those consequences unavoidable. In the United States, the effects are already being felt with the grade of society. During an interview that I conducted uh, with Judith Baker, an, an, an executive director with the Association of Lutheran Older Adults, uh, Baker stated that for the first time in history, older adults actually outnumber teenagers. By 2011, there will be around 11,000 baby boomers turning 65 every single day. Will these people be able to retire? Looting has left Social Security and pension programs insolvent, so it is highly unlikely that both boomers will be leaving the workforce anytime soon. A decent amount of replacement births could have generated a labor force that could replenish the Social Security fund and pension programs, but abortion and other eugenical practices have contributed to dismal replacement levels, so retirement may actually disappear entirely from our society. Working later in life will prove to be a challenge for many. Baker also told me during the interview I conducted with her that 20% of people have to deal with an instrumental activities of daily living limitation, or, a I or IADL, by age 75. By age 85, one out of three men and one out of two women have more than uh, more, have one or more IADL limitations. For the older workers, these IADL limitations will instantly preclude several jobs that call for a lot of physical 
activity. You're not going to see a lot of a lot of 85 year olds with replacements lifting boxes down at the uh, FedEx plant or um, basically working on an assembly line. Uh, if there are any assembly lines left after the deindustrialization campaign that is taking place, it has been taking place for uh, since since uh, NAFTA and GATT free trade uh, got underway back in the 90s. This sad trend shows no sign of abating. In the next 20 years, there will be a 74% increase in people over 50 and only a 1% increase in people under and under 50. So as you can see, uh, that's the sad irony that in the name of preventing a catastrophe, the elite are actually causing another catastrophe to, uh, to arise. In the name of saving the earth, they are causing the, the human race to actually enter into a, demogra a demographic winter. And it's questionable whether many of the uh, nations out there that have entered into this demographic winter, Iran in particular, Iran leading the charge, it's the number one country hit by the demographic winter, will have the populations necessary to maintain some kind of economic and uh, social and, and uh, political stability. The fear of, of environmental meltdown also serves as pretext for other pieces of the power elite's agenda. Environmental alarmism will also allow the elite to introduce a radical shift in mankind's spiritual spirituality. The Abrahamic religions of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam have become an, impe an impediment to the oligarchs because they fiercely restrict usury and slavery to major precepts of elitism and oligarchy. These religions are to be replaced with a form of spirituality that is supposedly earth-friendly. The New World religion will seek to preserve the planet by deifying it. Strong is one of the architects of this New World religion. Uh, a, prime, uh, 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 a good example of, of, his, uh, of his dedication to this, uh, to this earth friendly New Age faith came during the June 1992 UN Earth Summit in Brazil. Um, at that summit, uh, Marie Strong was the, uh, was the Secretary General, and, um, he, made, and he basically sponsored uh, the Declaration of the Sacred Earth, Sacred Earth Gathering um, and, and stated, quote, the changes in major in, in the changes in behavior and direction called for here must be rooted in our deepest spiritual, moral, and ethical values. Unquote. Now, if one looks at the Declaration of the Sacred Earth Gathering, one finds uh, that the, ecolo uh, the, the ecological crisis is is referred to as as a situation that quote transcends all nas national religious, cultural, social, political, and economic boundaries. The responsibility of each human being today is to choose between the force of darkness and the force of light. We must therefore transform our attitudes and our values in adopting renewed respect for the superior law of divine nature." Unquote. Now, from that quote, one might uh, pick up on some serious, serious uh, Psychological, uh, psychological problems because basically um, the, the uh, declaration is ascribing ra rational thought to a to a predicate without any without a, without a subject. It's it's like walking up to a tree and giving a tree a compliment and expecting the tree to actually respond to your compliment. This is the kind of belief system that Strong, the multi-billionaire, that sets uh, that sets uh, uh, the capstone of the pyramid, if you will, uh, that sets among the Olympians, sets among the elites, believes that it, uh, this this irrational belief system, this man in the 
powerful position actually actually takes it takes it quite serious. Strong has drawn from his own New Age faith during the formulation of the new of the of the new of new world religion. The New Age movement is essentially a hodgepodge of antichristic occultic traditions. The movement aims to bring about a pagan revival with an abandonist twist. The new age, the neo pagan revival of the New Age, uh, uh, has very uh, few transcendent features. In a New Age theology, divine presence indwells the material cosmos. It cannot be ontologically amputated from it. As a result, the planet is seen as sacred, and the Abrahamic faith, the faiths are chastised for divorcing the creation from the Creator. For the New Ager, a belief in a Creator separated from the creation did, 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 did actually distances man from true divinity, which was ascribed to nature. Helena Protrovna Blavatsky, the high priestess of the New Age movement, expressed these new, these, these anti-Christic uh, sentiments when she wrote, quote, Esoteric philosophy has never rejected God and nature, nor deity, as the absolute and abstract end. It only refuses to accept any of the gods of the so-called monotheistic religions, gods created by man in his own image and likeness of blasphemous and sorry caricature, caricature of the ever unknowable, unquote. Strong and his wife Anne demonstrated their dedication to the earth-based New Age faith by building the New Age equivalent of the Vatican in the San Luis Valley of Colorado at the foot of the Sacre uh, San de Cristo Mountains near Cresto, known as the Baca, this New Age center includes an ashram, a mother goddess temple for Vedic de devotees, a solar-powered Hindu temple, and a subterranean place of worship for Zen Buddhists. Just about every faith is represented, with the exception, of course, of the traditional Abrahamic faiths. The story behind the Baka is frightening. Strong and his wife claimed that a mystic prophesied to them that the Baka, uh, that the Baka play a central role in an, in, in an approaching apocalypse. The mystic stated, quote, the Baca would become the uh, center for a new planetary order which would evolve from the economic collapse and environmental catastrophes that would sweep the globe in the years to come, unquote. Apparently, Strong is well aware of his fellow elite's intentions to destroy the old world order and replace it with a new one. Strong and his wife wish to play a pivotal role in the emerging New World Order, and that is the prime motivation behind the creation of the Baca. The megalomaniacal strongs wish to be the major spiritual leaders after traditional civilization is swept away. Several elites, such as the Rockefellers and Rothschilds, have actually made pilgrimages to the Baca. For the oligarchs, the, uh, the Baca not only represents the, re the religion, of the ruling class, it is also the Baca is also the end of epicenter for humanity's future spirituality. Just in closing and wrapping up in my section, it's interesting to note, Phil, that you know uh, Huxley used to write about not wanting any higher power that would keep him from uh, from uh, exercising his his own free will in any in any way he he chose. It seems now that 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 the power elite of our day have actually been able to keep a, retain a belief in a higher power, but they've kept that that higher power obscure and amorphous enough to uh, and, and, and actually uh, <laughs> morally relativistic uh, to where it, it, that higher power can allow them to do just about just about anything they they, they please. Well, it's interesting that you should say that in, in the uh, book uh, Jesus Among Other Gods uh, by Ravi Zacharias, an outstanding uh, Christian uh, apologist, and I'd recommend that book to just about everybody in the listening audience. Uh, Ravi Zacharias explains uh, the origins of this new faith, the new age, uh, which is quite uh, a uh, quite a paradoxical title to bestow upon the religion, given the fact that it's actually an amalgam 
of uh, the uh, you know older pagan things of antiquity, uh, uh, combined with a, a few uh, modern, a few modern uh, beliefs and a few uh, uh, modern interpretations. But um, he says, "quote Common sense tells us that we cannot live without a law. But how does one generate a moral law if God has not spoken?" The only answer is to arrange a morality of one's own design that, though mystical and transcendent, is attainable by one's own efforts. In this way, we appeal to our spiritual bent and at the same time incorporate ourselves at the center. If we can be good without God but retain a religiosity, we win both the secular and the sacred. The New Age philosophies came in in order to satisfy this demand. What better way to apply an economic theory of supply and demand than, than to manufacture a religion that is limitless, it, 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 that is limitless supply and can be tailored to fit one's personal demand? A personalized religion with an impersonal God, that's what it is. This kind of religion by its nature has an immense capacity to reflect the pragmatic, a chameleon's dream, unquote. So as you can see, that if for all practical purposes, uh, while they wish to uh, retain uh, some sort of uh, mystical faith in, in a transcendent, uh, uh, although quite honestly the New Age uh, doesn't really exhibit many transcendent uh, features, it's more so a man, it, it uh, depicts God as a force that indwells uh, the uh, ontological uh, confines of the physical universe. Uh, they, they, they have uh, basically developed their own religious state, uh, uh, rel uh, religious worldview. They've engaged in what's known as uh, religious engineering. And that's a term that was coined by the uh, Process Church, uh, which was uh, a sect that uh, resulted from a schism in uh, Scientology. But it's basically, according to uh, sociologist Williamson Spainbridge, the conscious and skilled uh, creation of a brand new religion. And uh, that's, that, that's for all practical purposes what they have done. That religion acts as a rationale for uh, their own pragmatic ends. Uh, it basically serves uh, self-interest. It's an anthropocentric uh, religion also because it places man at the center of things uh, as opposed to Christianity, which contrary to what many uh, environmentalists would have you believe about Christianity, they claim that Christianity is an anthropocentric faith. That is not the case. Uh, in fact, if you read the scriptures quite closely, it makes clear Jesus says at one point to uh, his to his disciples, he says, "I am the, the, the I am the vine, and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing." Now that's hardly an anthropocentric statement. That's a theocentric statement. That's precisely what Christianity is. It's a theocentric faith. It's a faith which places all the emphasis upon God and not upon man. So uh, environmentalism, which is providing the segue into uh, the New Age religions, uh, is providing a segue into a, an anthropocentric, uh, uh, an anthrop an anthropocentric faith, um, one where man falls into the uh, nucleus of the cosmos and he becomes the sole source of his salvation, um, and that, of course, is Gnostic uh, soteriology. Um, and it's interesting because Maurice Strong, and I'm paraphrasing him now, Maurice Strong has said that uh, we are, for all practical purposes, God's deciding our own destiny. And this notion of man being God, this, this notion of, of man being uh, apotheosized and uh, basically being uh, a deity uh, in and of himself, is fraught with internal contradictions. And I'll cite Ravi Zacharias again. He uh, basically critiques the uh, view of man as God. This is a view that you hear several New Age, uh, New Age uh, ideologues, such as Shirley MacLaine, espousing. Shirley MacLaine, by the way, has been a visitor to the to the Baca. Absolutely. Uh, and also uh, uh, more uh, more imbecilic uh, individuals, such as uh, Michael Tesseri, loves to play himself off as a scholar, but he hardly, hardly uh, exhibits any of the aptitude of a scholar. He has excoriated uh, people, particularly Christians, for uh, decrying uh, the doctrine of man becoming God, saying that that's not even 
uh, insanity. That's unsane. Uh, loving to coin his own ter- uh, his own terms uh, in the grand tradition of other Joker, uh, you know, other Jokers and other uh, wannabe uh, researchers such as uh, Alan Watt. And, but the, the view of, of man as God is actually fraught with internal contradictions. The view of God being an abandoned force, the God that dwelling uh, all things, is fraught with internal contradictions, as is uh, evidenced by uh, the critique by Ravi Zacharias in his book, Jesus Among Other Gods. He writes, quote, With repeated effort, noted scholars and practitioners have tried to shade the truths of Christianity and make them resemble their own worldviews, verses such as, The kingdom of God is in you, or I and my father are good, are used to sustain pantheism. Some of the most renowned Hindu philosophers have strained to make this point and tell us there is no difference. Any reading of the context in which these statements and scriptures were made shows clearly the illicit use of the text by those who seek to distort them. This reasoning is in violation of both logic and theism. What begins with a subtle departure from the truth by the allurement of self-deification ultimately results in the deification of everyone and everything. Such a world would be destroyed by powers of conflict because every power would claim autonomy. That is why Hinduism's epics are full of war and killing as an integral part of being gods and goddesses. Animal features emerge on the divine and the stories behind them leaving one utterly puzzled and into the mix of polytheism the pantheism. Other divinities are added. Rivers, wind, and fire world of God making had begun. The Christian scriptures are dramatically different. When God sent the plagues upon Egypt in the Old Testament, they were designed to show that he alone was supreme over the objects that they had deified, rivers, planets, creatures, magic, and so on, and that there was no other like him. Nature, humanity, and every other entity or quantity is distinct from God. We cannot try to eliminate that distinction so for all practical purposes, you see the problem that the internal contradictions with the belief that all things are God and God is all things, because if that were the case, then the very ground we would walk on would eventually elect to remove itself from beneath our feet, because it could lay claim to autonomy. After all, is it not God? So the, the claim that all is God and God is all is uh, just it's just fraught with uh, hopelessly irreconcilable contradictions. Um, before we proceed any further, though, uh, we'd like to uh, thank our uh, sponsor, Suge Koji, uh, martial arts and engineer. Suge Koji's martial arts and engineer offers uh, some of the uh, finest martial arts equipment, uh, swords, grappling hooks, uh, outfits, uniforms. Uh, and all, uh, he also offers uh, instructional books, and tapes, cassettes, uh, all for your martial arts needs. So, uh, we urge all the listeners to check out Suke Koji's Martial Arts and uh, Ninja Gear, and we thank Suke Koji for his gracious sponsorship. Also, we'd like at this uh, point to uh, 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 tell the listeners a little uh, about where they can uh, pick up a copy of our book, The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship and the Examination of Epistemic Autocracy from the 19th to the 20th century. Many of the topics that we discussed tonight are also covered in that book. You want the 2006 Book Search Edition? It's available at Amazon.com. Just enter the ascendancy of the scientific dictatorship into the search engine, and you should uh, find it uh, with little or no hassle. Also, uh, a comprehensive uh, collection of all of our articles on the Internet are available at Terry Melanson's excellent Conspiracy Archive. That's ConspiracyArchive.com. Just go to ConspiracyArchive.com. Click on the commentators link, and you'll be taken to a list of uh, the uh, writers who have contributed to a Conspiracy Archive, and you'll see all of my names there. You click that link, and you'll be taken to the most comprehensive collection of all of our articles on the World Wide Web. Uh, there's also archived audio there in the blog section. Well, uh, you provided the segue, Paul, so I'll take it from there, as I made clear in last week's discussion. Radical Environmentalism acts as a segue for the introduction of pantheism. This contention is reinforced by the radical environmentalists' uh, consistent attribution of divinity to nature. The invocation 
of anthropomorphic appellations such as Mother Earth and Gaia is commonplace in radical environmentalist rhetoric, yet radical environmentalism does not venerate any sort of anthropomorphic god. Instead, the radical environmentalist venerates an impersonal god force. Pantheism can be encapsulated within the aphorism, God is the whole. Pantheism holds that God and the material cosmos are ontologically equivalent. God indwells the physical universe and cannot be ontologically divorced from it. Thus, according to pantheism, God is synonymous with the material cosmos. Pantheism promotes the anatist conception of divine presence. Now, I've already touched on uh, abandonism as it is applicable to soteriolo uh, soteriological uh, social movements like communism and fascism. And not surprisingly, both of these competing camps of socialism promote their own environmentalist doctrines. For example, the Communist Party USA National Chairman Gus Hall recognized the compatibility of environmentalism with the paracletic abandonism of uh, Marxism. In 1972, Hall stated, quote, In the struggle to save the environment, we must be the leaders of these movements. Human society cannot basically stop the destruction of the environment under capitalism. Socialism is the only structure that makes it possible, unquote. Uh, another case in point is uh, Greenpeace, whose unilateral nuclear freeze campaign received KGB funds during the 1980s. In uh, the book, The Enemy of Nature, uh, eco-socialist Joel Pohl cites Marx as, quote, a main originator of the ecological worldview, unquote. In the first ten years of Soviet Russia, scientists like Alexander uh, Bogdanov attempted to, quote, integrate production with natural laws and limits, unquote. Stalin eventually purged the ecologist and uh, embraced the theories of uh, Trofim Lysenko, uh, this point of departure notwithstanding, though the fact remains that Marxism's paracletic abandonism was compatible with radical environmentalism's inherent pantheism. Meanwhile, the Nazis, which constituted the dialectical rivals of the communists, embraced their own variety of radical uh, environmentalism. For instance, uh, Ernest Lehman, a, a professor of uh, botany, once wrote, quote, we recognize that separating humanity from nature from the whole of life leads to the humankind's own destruction and to the death of nations. Only through a reintegration of humanity into the whole of nature can our people be made stronger. That is the fundamental point of the biological task of our age. Humankind alone is no longer the focus of thought, but rather life as a whole. Thus, uh, this striving toward connectedness with the totality of life, with nature itself, the nature into which we are born, this is the deepest meaning and the true, true essence of national socialist thought, unquote. The implicit in this statement is the occult belief that the individual is merely a receptacle, uh, receptacle for being, which in turn must be reunited with the monad of uh, nature itself. Uh, astute listeners will recognize the parallels between uh, layman's views and Gnostic cosmology. Listeners will recall our discussion of Gnostic cosmology in episode one, traditional Gnosticism, held that the pneuma of man was wedded to the divine pneuma in, in a pre-cosmic unity, and that co uh, unity was divided by a lesser god uh, that the Gnostics equated with Jehovah. The Manitist Gnosticism transplants the pre-cosmic unity within the ontological plane of the physical universe. For the Manitist Gnostic of radical environmentalism, the totally biologicized pneuma of man it was at some point in the past wedded to the pneuma of nature and maintaining the uh, mesotheistic uh, proclivities of traditional Gnosticism, radical environmentalist view the introduction of theistic conceptions of God, particularly Christianity, as the corrupting force that divorced the pneuma of man from the pneuma of nature. Of course, Gnostic cosmology provided the foundation for uh, the humanitist eschatology of all sociopolitical utopian movements. Layman's monadic conception of uh, nature also provides 
provides the metaphysical premises for the political doctrine of collectivism. These and the Manatist uh, eschatology and collectivism are two core dialectical commonalities shared by communism and Hitlerian fascism, or better known as Nazism. In uh, 1867, German zoologist uh, Ernest Haeckel coined the term ecology. Haeckel was the German apostle of Darwin, proselytizing the German people with the secular evangel of evolution. It comes as a little surprise that the founder of ecology would embrace Darwinism. After all, Darwin had uh, suppo supposedly refuted all teleological Weltanschauungs. He had supposedly historicized nature. He had supposedly naturalized humanity. So removed from his position of imago vivi die, uh, man could be reunited with the monadic purity of nature itself. Many years later, French Jesuit uh, Pierre de, uh, Teilhard de Chardin would introduce evolutionary theory to the bosom of Catholicism, thereby spawning his own eco-theology. Uh, Teilhard uh, characterized evolution as Christogenesis, uh, the extension of the incarnation to the whole of humanity. In other words, Christ was being born through the emergent deity of man himself. And today, adherents of the New Age uh, movement speak of being Christed, which connotes apotheosis. So you see this very different uh, conception of, of Christ. And so if you hear, when you hear uh, the name of, of Christ invoked amongst uh, New Age adherents and amongst a radical environmentalist, I understand that it's being invoked in an entirely different context. It's been completely and totally torn from its moorings and then recontextualized. One of the uh, forerunners of the New Age movement, uh, which you mentioned earlier, Paul, uh, Helena Blavatsky, combined elements of Darwinian, uh, Darwinian evolution with spiritualism, Kabbalah, Western occultism, Buddhism, and Hinduism to form the religious doctrine of theosophy. Uh, Hitler was a devotee of theosophy and kept a copy of Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine by his bed. Ironically, the Third Reich would later ban theosophy in the 1920s, but nevertheless, the confluence of uh, ideas remained salient. What's important for listeners to derive from this discussion is Darwinism's role as a theoretical precursor to the monadic view of nature, which pervades the, bed, uh, uh, the bedrock for the New Age theology that uh, now pervades radical uh, environmentalism. Returning to uh, uh, Ernest Haeckel, it's uh, interesting to note that he formulated a social Darwinian philosophy dubbed monism. Uh, this philosophy held that the material cosmos was one. The sum totality of reality itself uh, was uh, the uh, was all one, and all one was uh, the, the, the ontological confines of the physical universe. And adherent to such a metaphysical doctrine is the explicit rejection of any form of uh, substance du uh, dualism. Thus, while Hegel reiterated traditional Gnostic uh, cosmology's theme of a fall from a pure spiritual unity, he transplanted that myth within the ontological confines of the physical universe. So gone was the radical dualism of traditional Gnosticism, but the theme of a lost singularity, that is to say, an Edenic condition of being one, remained. Such a theme was presented by Hegel's theoretical antecedents like Ernest Moritz Arndt, who uh, wrote in uh, an 1815 article, quote, when one sees nature in a necessary connectedness and interrelationship, then all things are equally important, shrub, worm, plant, human, stone, nothing first or last, but all one singular unity, unquote. Arndt's uh, particular variety of uh, environmentalism emphasized the welfare of the German folk and the soil that the uh, folk inhabited. Arndt's uh, environmentalism provided the metaphysical justification for the nationalism, xenophobia, and uh, racial supremacism that informed the Nazi Weltanschauung. And not surprisingly, Arndt uh, consistently condemned uh, uh, messagination. Uh, he basically claimed that the practice imperiled Germany's Teutonic.
Slavic racial purity. Uh, Art expressed derision for the Slavs, for the French, and of course, the Jews. Echoes of Art's uh, racial supremacism are discernible in Hegel's contention that the mythical Aryan exhibited, quote, symmetry of all parts and that equal development, which we call the type of perfect human beauty, unquote. Hegel founded the uh, German Monist League, which uh, blended uh, folkish doctrines with ecological holism. Reiterating the views of art, uh, Hegel decried miscegenation and promoted eugenics to maintain and develop Nordic racial superiority. Hegel would join the Thule Society, which played an integral role in the formation of the Nazi Party. Now, while the term ecology is invoked ad nauseum by the more credulous elements of the environmentalist uh, movement today, few of these silly, self-righteous activists are even remotely familiar with the resume of that term's originator. Nevertheless, they are either unconsciously or consciously working to enshrine the same sort of eco-theocratic totalitarianism envisioned by Hegel. As we have uh, previously established, radical environmentalism promotes a pantheistic neo-pagan abandoned cosmology. This cosmology predisposes radical environmentalism to scientism, after all. If the ontological confines of the material cosmos constitute the totality of reality itself, then it stands to reason the epistemological privacy should be bestowed exclusively upon quantifiable entities. Of course, the preoccupation with uh, quantifiable entities and rejection of a qualitative, of any qualitative considerations are hallmarks of scientism. Uh, from the scientific vantage point, Man is a quantifiable entity whose development can be calibrated according to uh, numerical, aesthetic, and intellectual skills. This uh, vantage point is demonstrable in Darwinism, which posited that uh, humanity was aligned with a developmental trajectory gradually migrating from savage races to civilized man. Uh, Darwin believed that uh, developmental uh, gradation was quantifiably and empirically demonstrable for Darwin. The savage races uh, possessed sloped foreheads, darker skin hues, and more often than not couldn't speak English. Such ideas were reiterated by Darwin's cousin, Sir Francis Galton, who uh, coined the term uh, eugenics. Hegel, the founder of ecology, was passionately, uh, uh, passionately uh, devoted to eugenics. He passionately clung such ideas. Galton uh, was himself inspired by the work of his cousin Darwin. In uh, Memories of Life, Galton wrote, quote, the publication in 1859 of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin made a marked epoch in my own mental development as it did in that of human thought generally. Its effect was to demol demolish a multitude of dogmatic barriers by a single stroke and to arouse a spirit of rebellion against all ancient authorities whose positive and unauthenticated statements were contradicted by modern science, unquote. Now, obviously, this, this has, obviously, if you view, uh, uh, the, uh, if you view um, evolutionary theory uh, uh, from the vantage point that uh, Galton was viewing it, uh, in this uh, particular excerpt, uh, one will see parallels between uh, the, this, uh, these revelations and uh, the uh, supposed religious experiences of mystics. Um, so there's really there's really a parallel here between uh, between Galton's uh, supposed epiphany and uh, the uh, religious experiences of uh, the mystics that he and uh, Darwin and other materialists. Uh, decried, um, which is quite ironic. Uh, however, uh, the uh, the religious vernacular uh, that's invoked by Galton uh, it becomes even more overt when one reads uh, inquiries into human faculty and its development, where Galton writes, "Quote: The chief result of these inquiries has been to elicit the religious significance of the doctrine of evolution." It suggests an alteration in our mental attitude and imposes a new moral
moral duty. The new mental attitude is one of a greater sense of moral freedom, responsibility, and opportunity. The new duty, which is supposed to be exercised concurrently with and not in opposition to the old ones upon which the social fabric depends, is an endeavor to further evolution, essentially that of the human race, unquote. That Galton recognized the religious significance of evolution is no accident. Uh, readers, uh, well, listeners will recall uh, our installment, uh, the first installment of the Collins Brothers Unleashed, where we discussed how uh, Darwinism actually acted as a uh, Gnostic myth, because in essence it uh, provided uh, anthropocentric soteriology, that is, the doctrine of self salvation, with uh, the metaphysical support of uh, the doctrine of self-creation, which was encapsulated in uh, the uh, thesis of spontaneous generation upon which uh, Darwin's uh, theory rested. Thus, uh, the the idea that man uh, attains his own salvation, facilitates his own salvation through his own efforts, through his own cognitive abilities, is uh, reaffirmed by the... uh, notion that man was simply a spontaneously generated being, that that man was self-created. Uh, so we have this, this metaphysical bedrock upon which an anthropocentric soteriology can rest. <coughs> also, the readers will recall, uh, well, listeners will recall how in the uh, first installment we discussed how uh, the, uh, the how Hitlerian fascism and its uh, campaign of genocide, which came to be known as the Holocaust, it's the eugenics campaign, qualified as something of a uh, Gnostic, uh, something of a Gnostic campaign, a Gnostic crusade, because uh, through the Gnostic optic, uh, the history becomes, uh, history becomes a a redemptive crusade, whether for the uh, inanimatist Gnostic of the communist ilk, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Marxist, the, the Gnostic of, of, of Marxism, opposes the uh, corruption of man by the uh, and the redemption of humanity from thousands of years of uh, class oppression and uh, by the uh, emergence of the dictatorship of the proletariat. So we have that redemptive view of uh, history. The redemptive view of history as it was espoused by Hitler was that uh, the Nazis would uh, redeem man from uh, thousands of years of uh, biological and genetic corruption by uh, facilitating the emergence of the uh, Aryan. So, really, it comes as little surprise that uh, Galton would have observed uh, the quote-unquote religious significance of the doctrine of evolution, uh, because in actuality, now, the, the, the Darwinism really qualifies as a, a, a Gnostic myth uh, that provides uh, the, uh, the metaphysical uh, bedrock upon which, uh, a, upon which uh, an anthropocentric soteriology can be uh, laid. Uh, it, it, also, it, it also exhibits features of other uh, uh, occult, for, uh, occult beliefs and occult doctrines such as uh, the uh, Kabbalistic the uh, Gollum, uh, which uh, held that, uh, uh, basically presented a legend, a legend about a synthetically created man, um, that basically that life and non-life were uh, one and the same, that life could be brought from non-life. Well, that's that's really no different from uh, the claims of uh, evolutionists, which hold that uh, that a non-living, uh, non-living organ, a non-living Material actually became living organisms. That's uh, the, that's the belief in spontaneous uh, generation or a abiogenesis. Then throughout the years, uh, this this religion of emergent deities has uh, resurfaced under various appellations. Uh, Warren Wagar enumerates its, uh, numerous manifestations. Uh, he writes, "Quote: Nineteenth and early twentieth century thought." Teams with time-bound emergent deities. Scores of thinkers preached some sort of faith in what is potential in time in place of the traditional uh, Christian and mystical faith in a power outside of time. Engels, Feldgeist, 
Cobb's Humanite, Spencer's Organism, Organismic Humanity, Inevitably Improving Itself by the Laws of Evolution, Nietzsche's Doctrine of Superhumanity, The Conception of a Finite God-Given Currency by J.S. Mill, Hastings Rashdall and William James, The Vitalism of Bergson and Shaw, The Emergent and Evolutionism of Samuel Alexander and Lloyd Morgan, The Theories of Divine Immanence and the Liberal Movement in Protestant Theology, and Du Noel's Telephenalism, all of the are exhibits and evidence of the influence chiefly of evolutionary thinking, both before and after Darwin and Western intellectual history. The faith of progress itself, especially the idea of progress as built into the evolutionary scheme of things, is in every way the psychological equivalent of religion, unquote. And of course, uh, progress was, was religiously venerated uh, amongst the theoreticians of the uh, Enlightenment, which for all practical purposes represented a period of history during which uh, Gnostic doctrines uh, were codified as uh, revolutionary doctrines. And so we see the segue from uh, uh, occultism, uh, uh, occult belief systems, into uh, the uh, into uh, revolu- the form of uh, revolutionary belief systems, into the form of uh, political, uh, political soci- uh, social, the socio-political uh, utopian movements, so, uh, social, uh, soteriological, social movements, uh, out of which we see the emergence of communism and uh, fascism. But um, at any rate, um, this notion of uh, calibrating uh, humanity according to some scale, aesthetic scales, intellectual scales, uh, uh, numerical scales, is uh, still very much alive. Uh, For instance, uh, it was uh, none other than Peter Singer uh, who uh, wrote, quote, Darwin's theory undermined the the foundations of the entire Western way of thinking on the place of our, uh, of, uh, of, pardon me, Western way of thinking on the place of our species in the universe. He taught us that we too were animals and had a natural origin as the other animals did. As Darwin emphasized in the descent of man, the differences between us and the non-human animals are differences of degree, not of kind. Nor did he rest his case on physical similarities alone. The third and fourth chapters of the descent of man show that we can find our roots, the uh, find roots of our own capacities to love and to reason, and even of our moral sense in the non-human animals. Unquote. Well, as Singer made clear, the differences, according to evolutionary thought, uh, between man and animals are basically differences of degree. Uh, this statement implies that the sanctity of life requires a radical revaluation according to a hierarchical framework. If man did evolve, then some men are less human than others. Uh, this contention reiterates the elitist rationale satirized by uh, Orwell in Animal Farm. Some pigs are more equal than others. Thus, it would be reasonable to conclude that evolution is producing a race of overmen. Uh, of course, in every instance where this belief was appropriated legitimacy, its adherents have argued for state intervention, eugenical regimentation, all of which do realize the production of such a race. It was toward just such an end that uh, the scientific dictatorships of modern entity dev- uh, devoted their political policies and social programs. Uh, by the way, Peter Singer uh, has recently uh, argued for the rationing of health care uh, and uh, has f- uh, has promoted his uh, bioethicist uh, theories uh, heavily at this time when uh, the reformation of the uh, health care system is uh, one of the chief topics on the tables of uh, uh, pundits and uh, policymakers. So I think we kind of know where (laughs) Peter Sager is coming from, because if if there are only differences in degrees between us and animals, then evidently uh, the uh, loss of life, particularly amongst uh, uh, the elderly and the unborn, uh, is really not something to be lamented, but instead something to be examined as a viable course of, option, uh, of, of action in re- 
calculating our numbers. Uh, but again, all of this, all of this, uh, it, it, all of this basically uh, originated with uh, Darwinism, which uh, Galton uh, recognized the religious significance of in his own writings, and it has paved the way for uh, radical environmentalism, which is in and of itself a, a religion. Uh, in a recent uh, address to the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., uh, actually, this was uh, the address delivered, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was in 2007 or 2008. Uh, it was the Czech uh, president, uh, Václav Klaus, who declared, quote, environmentalism is a religion. It does not belong in the natural sciences and is more connected with social science, unquote. According to Klaus, the, this religion is purely a status one. It's designed to enthrone policy professionals that hope to rule from above, unquote, uh, quote, unquote. Klaus asserted that this religion worked in tandem with multiculturalism, with uh, social uh, democratism, and uh, internationalism, and other fashionable ideologies to accelerate the global tectonic shift towards supranationalism. Uh, these contentions seem to be reinforced by the admonitions of one of the environmentalists uh, patron saints, none other than Albert Gore. A cursory uh, perusal, of course, Earth in the Balance, uh, his tome of absolute garbage. Uh, the full title of that book is Earth in the Balance, Ecology and the Human Spirit, uh, reveals the religious character of environmentalism. It's replete with inherently religious tone, uh, terms like uh, moral, spirit, and, and heretical. So, in actuality, uh, Gore's book virtually qualifies as a sacred text. However, the religion that Gore uh, espouses is hardly uh, amiable to Christianity. Gore assails Christianity for the purported suppression of the, quote, goddess religion, which he contends uh, provided humanity with a, quote, spiritual sense of our place in nature, unquote. According to Gore, those who think otherwise will, quote, heretical, unquote, beliefs. Uh, Gore claims to be a Baptist. However, almost every assertion that he presents uh, is uh, actually a departure from uh, traditional Christian theological precepts. For instance, Gore reconceptualizes the Godhead as God, nature, and man, no longer is it uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, he, uh, he also will recognize there that man is placed within the Godhead, thereby uh, reinforcing this uh, notion of man as an emergent deity. So this notion of, of man, apotheosized man as a God himself, is very much uh, prevalent. Uh, he also rejects man's uh, universal position as he might uh, he die when he declares, quote, we cannot segregate the human heart from the environment. Man is organic with the world, unquote. Uh, Gore also expresses the belief that the totality of human int intellect is, quote, detached from man, unquote. It constitutes a, quote, new disembodied mind, unquote. But this new disembodied mind, uh, Gore contends, possesses absolute omniscience and can, quote, observe the movement of matter everywhere, unquote. So again, we have this, uh, this uh, belief in uh, omniscience, uh, man being a possessor of omniscience. And again, such beliefs were not uh, uncommon during the uh, early 19th and the 20th century, that those times teemed with uh, beliefs in uh, emergent deity. Uh, and interestingly enough, one promoter of uh, the uh, of uh, such a belief in emergent deity was none other than H.G. Wells, who was a Fabian socialist and a member of uh, the uh, Coefficients Club, which was uh, one of many uh, elite uh, think tanks. But uh, he believed in uh, what was known as the world brain. Uh, he believed that the individual was an illusion, the collective represented the sum totality of reality itself. It was only it was only in the group that meaning was found. So uh, we see here, uh, again, the, this, this collectivistic uh, conception of, of humanity, uh, which, uh, it, it, which implies
implies uh, the, uh, a collectivistic uh, societal configuration is in fact a desirable one and is the only workable one for uh, humanity. Um, interestingly enough, H.G. Wells also wrote uh, the introduction to Margaret Sanger's uh, book, The Pivot of Civilization. I briefly touched on The Pivot of Civilization last week, uh, which uh, was authored by Margaret Sanger, who is the darling of uh, the women's rights movement, uh, is considered a champion of reproductive rights, uh, a champion of women's rights, uh, a great progressive uh, uh, a great progressive thinker, but uh, in fact, uh, anybody who reads uh, Margaret Sanger's uh, Margaret Sanger's book, *The Pivot of Civilization*, uh, will find uh, somebody who is clearly not quite as uh, humanitarian or progressive as uh, the uh, modern uh, feminists would have you believe. Uh, in fact, uh, Margaret Sanger was a, a, a proponent of eugenics. She wrote, quote, birth control, which has been criticized as negative and destructive, is really the greatest and most truly eugenic method, and its adoption as part of the program of eugenics would immediately give a concrete and realistic power to that science as the most constructive and necessary of the means to racial health, unquote. Notice the terms there also, racial health. So evidently she shared uh, the... Uh, sentiments of uh, many of the Nazi eugenicists that uh, intellect could be calibrated uh, that, that intellect could be calibrated according to race uh, and racial distinctions uh, determined uh, one's own uh, uh, one's, uh, one's own uh, uh, cognitive aptitude uh, <laughs> Singer uh, believed that society's tolerance of morons as she put it, human weeds and the feeble minded was uh, basically encouraging this genetics that is uh, retrograde uh, evolution. Evolution no longer uh, moving forward in terms of the developmental trajectory, but now moving backwards. Uh, so to remedy this genetic threat, uh, Singer unabashedly promoted the implementation of uh, outright totalitarian measures. She wrote, quote, the emergency problem of segregation and sterilization must be faced immediately. Every feeble-minded girl or woman of the hereditary type, especially of the moron class, should be segregated during the reproductive period. We prefer the policy of immediate sterilization of making sure that parenthood is absolutely prohibited to the feeble-minded, unquote. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, there's, uh, shades, there, there's shades of that a particular mandate evident in China's one-child policy. Uh, there's, uh, there, of course, are prohibitions on uh, procreation. There, there were pro uh, prohibitions on procreation in Nazi Germany, and uh, numerous uh, radical environmentalists, uh, population control proponents, uh, several people of that ilk have pro uh, proposed the licensing of uh, parents. Nari Strong being one of those individuals who actually uh, suggested that at some given point in the, in the future that uh, licensing of, of, of parents would have, would have to become a reality, would become a necessity. Absolutely. And uh, to, 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 to round out this, uh, this uh, charming collection of gems uh, that were, were produced by uh, Margaret Sanger, uh, uh, I'll just uh, read uh, an excerpt from uh, an article she wrote called The Plan of Peace, RDRR, which uh, was uh, presented in Birth Control Review. It says, quote, to apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny is already tainted to apportion farmlands and homesteads for these segregated persons where they would be taught to work under competent instructors for the period of their entire lives, unquote. So evidently she felt that there should be a, a segregated portion of the, the, the population, uh, and that that popu population should be placed on reservations, uh, uh, basically com kept complete, completely and totally separate from uh, the healthy stock of uh, humanity. And bear in mind, uh, this would be no small sum of people to be relegated to such uh, an existence, because uh, 
according to Singer in the Pivot of uh, Civilization, uh, only 47.3, uh, 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 nearly half or 47.3 percent of the population had the mentality of 12-year-old children or less. So the majority of the population would be morons. And so what we're looking at is really, uh, uh, comparatively speaking, would be, have been a Holocaust that would have dwarfed even the Nazi, uh, the Nazis' eugenics program. Um, not surprisingly, and I mentioned this in the last installment, uh, Ernest Rudin, who was uh, the head of uh, the uh, head of the uh, Nazis' uh, uh, racial hygiene uh, program, wrote uh, uh, actually uh, wrote for a birth control review, uh, um, and it comes as a little surprise that Planned Parenthood's uh, board of directors included supporters of the Nazis, such as uh, Dr. Lothrop uh, Stoddard, who wrote a uh, book entitled The Rising Tide of Color Against uh, White Supremacy. But all of this, uh, all of these people are the, uh, the uh, antecedents of the, uh, of the modern uh, radical environmentalist movement. Um, and that is precise. It's such ideas that are actually, uh, that are, that are actually uh, uh, fueling the uh, crusade of the radical environmentalist. It has very little to do with really stemming the tide of environmental degradation. That's not to say that there is no environmental degradation uh, that's taking place. Obviously, there are genuine instances of environmental uh, degradation. We don't want to fall on the uh, other side of uh, this uh, Hegelian dialectic and uh, 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 occupy the other extreme pole of it. Uh, which would be uh, laissez-faire de de destructivist uh, environmentalism, which would basically give uh, free reign to uh, uh, corporations and private interests to do whatever they wish with the environment and uh, pour whatever contaminants they would like to into the river and, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, fill the air with uh, smoke from smokestacks uh, that would basically uh, cloud out the cloud out the sun. Obviously, we do not occupy that pole, uh, that that uh, extreme pole of the dialectic. But on the other on the other side of this of this dialectic, on the other the other uh, extreme pole, we have people who uh, are basically using uh, are basically using uh, uh, the environment as a pretext uh, to uh, promote. Uh, basically pr promote a, a kind of sick, uh, sick animal supremacism. For instance, uh, Peter Singer, who I mentioned earlier, spoke, spoke speaks about speciesism and uh, basic, uh, basically uh, uh, holds that anybody who uh, even attempts to make any sort of uh, distinction between man and animal is guilty of speciesism. Um, you also have the, the, this, this overwhelming you know, this, this overwhelming, uh, this overwhelming protective, these overwhelmingly protective impulses for animals, but little or no regard given whatsoever to, say, uh, the fetus that is about to have a vacuum uh, shoved into the back of its head and its brain sucked out. Uh, evidently, there is, uh, there, there is a double standard there. <coughs> but it ultimately, what, ultimately, it is not the environment, it is not the environmental degradation that, that concerns these people. It is this sick amalgam of both anthropocentrism, the belief that man is the central element of the universe, and at the same time anti-human, uh, anti-human self-loathing that comes together into this paradoxical and, and uh, actually uh, uh, contradictory uh, belief system. Uh, and, and that that basically informs their worldview, um, <clears throat> and so so that is in actuality what is motivating them. And then ultimately, for the parallel, I established this in the last uh, uh, installment. We to we uh, establish this in our book. The uh, ultimate uh, the ultimate concern is not carrying capacity. It's not it's not a regulation of numbers so as to uh, ensure. The uh, health of our uh, uh, 
of nature and of our surrounding environment. It is uh, instead the capacity of their control. They are concerned with uh, differential fertility, but especially since they have uh, practiced, uh, uh, consciously practiced uh, uh, family land, uh, 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 limited family planning, and they even have engaged in sordid traditions of inbreeding uh, to s maintain their supposed genetic uh, superiority. Now their numbers are dwindling, and uh, they are disproportionately smaller and compared to, to ours, and compared to the numbers of the common man. And so, in order to uh, in order to deal with that differential fertility, they must promote uh, population control uh, under the guise of uh, of conservation and environmentalism. But it's uh, interesting, also, Paul, that you brought up uh, Marie Strong's connection with uh, Adnan Khashoggi. Uh, and of course, Adnan Khashoggi has been uh, connected to the 9 11 truth. It yeah, was during John Gray. He basically brought up John Gray's old men are from Mars, women are from Venus shtick when the book was going into the bargain uh, bin at the, uh, at the local bookstore. I guess nobody wanted it. No. Mm -hmm. And he basically pumped it full of money and kept, uh, kept uh, John Gray in, in business. Gray himself is a new age guru new age thinker. And John Gray, of course, has been, has been known to give money to uh, certain portions of the 9-11 Truth Movement. And so it's interesting that we find within the 9-11 Truth Movement very little in the way of truth, but instead a kind of a rogue gallery of different cults, uh, different new age flavored cults, such as Scientology and uh, the Urantia Movement and uh, and uh, the Mormons, such as uh, such as uh, David Ray Griffin, the Zeitgeist movement, the Zeitgeist movement, yes, and uh, this might not be by accident. It might not be. It might not be by accident that, that Khashoggi is a, was involved with with you know basically uh, in, in this way with 9/11, and that then 9/11 goes on to reflect in many different ways. Uh, Strong's own incoherent spirituality and his own weird New Age uh, faith. It, it may it may not be by by mere uh, by mere uh, accident that that has occurred. Right now, and also um, um, uh, you uh, mentioned earlier the uh, dismantling of of industrial civilization, and it's interesting that always as a necessary precursor to that. Uh, the, uh, people such as strong cite a, uh, a, a, an economic collapse. Um, um, and people such as strong are, 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 uh, ironically are the products of an economic collapse because he lived during the Depression. You'll find that, that in the midst of, of uh, economic, uh, economic downturns such as the Depression, uh, radical enclaves of thought uh, tend to thrive during the, uh, during the, uh, the uh, Great Depression. Socialist, uh, uh, several different varieties of socialism, uh, technocracy, uh, you know, several different technocratic uh, uh, sects, uh, and, and uh, other, uh, you know, other weird, weird uh, uh, cults uh, thrived, and uh, that that seems to be the case again today. Um, that, that during uh, during this uh, during the uh, in the midst of this uh, current. Uh, this current economic downturn, we see uh, radical ideas becoming palatable again. And I find it interesting that he believed that uh, uh, that uh, the uh, collapse of the, of the economy was uh, necessary to facilitate the uh, changes that uh, he hoped to see take place. And he talked about this kind of an apocalyptic situation, this kind of scenario, so much that it begs the question: Did he know something? Did he, did, he, did, did he understand that plans were unfolding in certain sectors of the of the uh, oligarchical, uh, the global oligarchical establishment uh, to to basically bring about a collapse? We do know we do know that that Alan Greenspan knew about the bubbles on Wall Street and did nothing to stop those bubbles from from being built, and as a matter of fact, pumped the system full of liquidity. Encouraged the, the, the inflation of those bubbles, and um, 
It could be that, that it, it seems to me what the evidence seems to suggest is that the power elite were hoping to make a lot of money and then hoping for a soft landing with uh, probably about a 15% uh, decline uh, when the bubble started to lose its air. They, they f found, however, that they had made a gross miscalculation and that their soft landing was turning into a hard landing and now they've switched gears and are trying to build this back up very quickly. Right, absolutely. Um, it's also interesting, though, that in, that deindustrialization of companies, uh, uh, the companies, the, the plants, uh, you know, the, the agendas of several radical environmentalists, because that was that was one of the uh, one of the mandates presented by Thomas Malthus in his uh, uh, essay on population, which I covered uh, a few weeks back, um, uh, and I, 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 I find that that with with deindustrialization, whatever, what, what it, in actuality is part of, is a part of a campaign of uh, technological apartheid. Apartheid, basically, that, that term means separate development. And that's, that's uh, for all practical purposes, what the power of Italy uh, wishes to see for humanity's separate development apart from it within uh, terribly narrow parameters of, of industry, uh, ter terribly narrow parameters in terms of infrastructure, um, and of course that would help to limit our numbers because uh, exposure to the elements of uh, being deprived of vaccines against uh, uh, deadly diseases, what have you, would actually lead to uh, more demographic declines amongst the uh, common man. Well, it's interesting to get, once again, um, you know, uh, Murray Strong does uh, have have a background in big oil, and that's where he made a, the majority of his fortune. He, he's an oil he's he's an oil tycoon. So uh, it, it it doesn't it doesn't look like he's expecting to sacrifice any of the luxuries that that fortune has afforded afforded him, and um, he and he doesn't seem to be uh, being asked to dismantle. Uh, any um, of his of, of the uh, of the oil plant, oil uh, oil plants or any oil oil facilities that he no he, you're not going to see him dismantling any sort of refineries at any, at any time <coughs> it's just not going to happen you know, interestingly enough we discussed this in the book the ascendancy of the scientific dictatorship uh, we discussed uh, peak oil and how peak oil the theories of peak oil were actually promulgated by. Uh, oil companies, um, um, and uh, uh, I believe it's uh, we we quote extensively from from a newsletter of uh, ASMO, uh which uh, is basically committed to the study of peak oil uh, and, and how uh, the uh, adherents of, of ASPO, uh actually promote uh, you know promote uh, radical depopulation campaigns even even at times uh, saying that it might become necessary for uh, the use of uh, weapons of mass destruction to wipe out entire segments of the population so as to relieve uh, population pressure on the environment and uh, to mitigate some of the effects of peak oil. That's true. That's another, that's a whole other aspect that we could go into. I I hope that this has been an information dense uh, presentation for our listening audience uh, over over Marie Strong. I usually don't place a whole lot of stock in his living uh, uh, fiction. I find it to be exactly that fiction prepared uh, to entertain uh, you know entertain the mind and uh, basically tantalize our imaginations. Uh, but if if it, it, as, as time moves on in Sun and Shade, it does appear to, to, to me that, that Marie Strong is, is in the embodiment of, of everything that uh, Ian Fleming had in mind when he created the character of Stavros Blofeld, who was basically uh, uh, James Bond's arch rival who sat in charge of, of Spectre. He, he has the, the fanatical beliefs, he has the money and the power and we now know from his own words that that he has the motive the yeah. motive. I thought that was the most damning of the revelations that he gave was his connection with terrorist organizations and then the presentation of a scenario in his Ramon I Clef where uh, a terror where terrorists actually uh, 
terrorists actually. Well, they, he says they're not terrorists, but then they, that the, 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 uh, the elite commit a terrorist act, right? right. Using using and mercenaries paying off individuals that for all intents purposes are are uh, terrorists to yeah. to basically shift from from mercenary to to, to, to terrorist stripe. And of course, uh, the use of mercenaries is not a common as is evidenced by Black Water or Z. But yeah, and they're getting bigger too. We know that Comfort Black who had a position with Blackwater. Um, he 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 has has been alleged. He, he it is alleged that he said at a at an international conference in Amman, uh, Jordan, that that um, Blackwater was now able uh, to uh, to provide brigade sized units for low intensity combat all over the world. And now he has denied having ever said that, but when one looks at the infrastructure, when one looks at Blackwater or Z as it is now called, it's not hard to imagine that that has been the case. And uh, and so it's it's possible that he did in fact that he did in fact uh, say, say those words when one looks at looks at the size and scope of it's possible that he did in fact say those words when one considers the size and scope of these private military uh, companies and just how large they're getting the CB principle of, of, among them yeah or pro- possibly expressed such uh, sentiments uh, or you know such contention in another setting um, but at any rate um, and, uh, many of the topics that we've discussed tonight can be uh, found in our book The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship if the listeners would like to uh, check it out, it's available through Amazon.com. You want the uh, 2006 book search edition. It's been expanded and revised considerably. Um, the full title is The Ascendancy of the Scientific Dictatorship, an Examination of Epistemic Autocracy from the 19th to the 21st Century. Um, and just go to Amazon.com, enter it in, in the search engine, and uh, you should find it with little or no uh, hassle whatsoever. Those who would like to uh, read uh, some of our articles, the most comprehensive collection of all those articles can be found at Gary Melanson's excellent Conspiracy Archive website. That's conspiracyarchive.com. Just go to the common commentators uh, link, click on that. Uh, you'll find the list of the uh, contributing uh, writers to uh, Conspiracy Archive. And then Paul and I are there listed among them. You click on that, you'll find the most comprehensive collection of our articles on the World Wide Web. Also in the blog set, the section there is archived audio. Um, those who uh, would like to, uh, the, those who would like to, uh, uh, you know, go back and, and basically uh, uh, get, gain a little bit more background uh, on what we've discussed tonight, feel free to uh, revisit some of the older episodes. They're still there on Podomatic. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just, uh, uh, feel free to go back, take copious notes, and uh, that, that all that information can help you contextualize some of what uh, you've heard tonight. Um, lastly, we'd like to thank our uh, gracious sponsor, Suke Koji, uh, and uh, martial arts and ninja gear. Suke Koji provides uh, all the uh, martial arts equipment that one might need, swords, grappling hooks, outfits, uh, and uh, instructional books, tapes, cassettes, uh, all for your martial arts needs. So uh, check out Suke Koji's uh, martial arts and uh, ninja gear. We'd like to thank everybody for listening. Feel free to drop us a line at the Collins Bros, T-H-E-C-O-L-L-I-N-S-B-R-O-S at yahoo.com. Give us your feedback, some of your comments, some of your thoughts, uh, possibly even a request for future show topics. Um, and uh, we hope to hear uh, we hope that you'll be here again uh, and uh, listening to us for the next installment of the Collins Bros Unleashed.
out of the bush to cut wood, he saw his educated mother lose her mind to severe depression. It would be impossible not to be moved by such a tale, unquote. One would think that such an experience would make the youthful strong recognize the benefits of technology and infrastructure. His memory of the depression, however, would have a different impact. In the September 1, 1997 edition of the National Review magazine, Strong is quoted as saying, quote, The Great Depression left me, frankly, very radical, unquote. Strong spent much of his childhood questioning America's system of free enterprise, concluding that it was the reason for the harsh conditions of the Depression. This hostility increased when Strong went to high school and found himself under the supervision of a socialist principal. By age 14, Strong alleged, uh, alleges to have sh- uh, skipped four grades and qualified for a university entrance. Whether this is true or not is debatable, however, given Strong's subscription to some of the more unscientific and, qu- uh, sh- and questionable ecological disaster theories. It was at his, uh, this time that the teenage Strong became fascinated with nature and began spending time secluded in forest areas trying to learn about natural cycles. One can see the beginning of Strong's melding of, the, of environmentalism with socialism in these early experiences. Strong's socialist ideologies would come out later in life. During a February 13, 1974 address at Iona College of Windsor, at that time, Strong had climbed the ranks of the world's elite to become the head of the United Nations Environment Program. Recall that Phil went into the United Nations position as an elite imagination during the uh, last program. We urge everybody to uh, go back and review that show. Strong used his new... Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's time once again for the Collins Brothers Unleashed with your host, Paul and Philip Collins. Hello, this is Paul and Philip Collins welcoming you to another episode. Last uh, time, Philip explored the dark side of the environmental movement and the power elite's use of, co- of concern over climate change and environmental degradation as a pretext for depopulation schemes. This week, we are going to build a little on that theme while moving into some new areas. We're going to place Canadian multi-billionaire and former Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Marie Strong, under a magnifying glass. His involvement in the environmentalist, environmentalist movement is important because he, like many other members of the global oligarchical establishment, appears to be using environmental alarmism as a means of fulfilling an elite agenda. Strong, like other members of the power elite, is a global mover and shaker that the majority of people have never even heard of. Mention his name to the common man on the street and you will receive one of many stock responses. Maurice who? Or what TV show was he on? These responses illustrate a common problem that exists today among the media-treated masses. Unless a person has performed in front of Simon, Randy, Kara, and, uh, and Ellen, Joe Average Citizen has no clue who, who he or she is. But Kelly Clarkson, Clay Aiken, Carrie Underwood, and the other starstruck boobs that populate everyone's favorite TV show do not even begin to wield the influence of power held by men like Strong. Strong's beginnings were anything but sinister. He was born in April 1929 at Oak Lake, Manitoba, Canada, to a family that, like so many other families at the time, was hard hit by the Depression. Writing about Strong's youth, the financial position to push socialist ideas. During the address, Strong lambasts the West for its, quote, preoccupation with the physical, the material, the quantitative aspects of our lives, an obsession with the notion that more is better in all things. The relentless application of purely economic criteria to decision-making has grossly distorted allocation of resources in favor of highest economic return rather than of social priority, unquote. He also called on America the developed nation, and, and the developed nations to have, quote, a much larger flow of resources between rich and poor countries with, the hem, with heavy emphasis on the provision of, ba- of basic s- social services to the poorest sectors, unquote. Underneath the quixotic language, one can plainly see the promotion of global wealth redistribution. 
Before strong and other elitist socialism is a tool for creating a selective capitalism that favors the elite and excludes everyone else. In McLean's magazine, Strong was quoted as having said, quote, I am a socialist in ideology and a capitalist in methodology, unquote. One can see the mixture of ideology and methodology illustrated by Strong's activities as founding president, chairman, and CEO of PetroCan, the Canadian oil company. Lord Guter elaborated in a July 16, 2003 column for the Edmonton Journal, quote, Strong enthusiastically supported Ottawa's first major intrusions into pro provincial resource management, such as the elimination of deductions for provincial resource royalty payments from federal income tax. The, the, the Liberals euphemistically called this revenue sharing because it took income that would go that would have gone into the investors' pockets and oil companies' bank accounts in the form of tax rebates and, and, and shared it with the federal government, which forcibly kept it in Ottawa. Strong also also favored heavy federal subsidies to Petrocan for frontier exploration. These gave the federal oil company a competitive advantage over privately held oil companies with the hope the Canadian company would eventually control the lion's share of the oil reserves. Eventually, private oil companies were forced by the Liberals to sell a portion of their successful explorations to Ottawa Oil, as Petrocan was often called. Unquote. So, the audience can surmise from that quote that Strong, like any good cartel capitalist, used government regulations and restrictions to snuff out the competition and create a monopoly. Strong has a career in the oil business that stretches back to the 1950s. According to Ronald Bailey in a September 1, 1997 article for National Review magazine entitled Who is Marie Strong? The Canadian took control of several small energy companies that were failing in the 1960s and, quote, he was president of a major holding company, the Power Corporation of Canada, by the age of 35, unquote. Big oil, therefore, is excluded from Strong's excoriation of industrialization's ne negative effects on the environment. The rest of the of industrialized civilization, however, may have to fall in Strong's view. According to Bailey, one of Strong's more memorable quotes warns, quote, If we don't cha change, our species will not su survive. Frankly, we may get to the point where the only way of saving the world will be for industrial civilization to collapse, unquote. Marie Strong also fantasized about the fall of industrialized civilization during an interview with journalist Daniel Wood. This time, Strong's fantasy came with a conspiratorial twist, with members of the power elite actually working together to collapse industrial civilization. Strong informed Wood that he was planning a novel about a group of world leaders who reached the conclusion that the only way to save the planet from a global environmental catastrophe was to intentionally collapse the economies of the first world nations, which, of course, Strong views as the environment's worst offenders. Wood shared Strong's plot in a May 1990 article for West Magazine entitled The Wizard of Baca Grande. Wood writes, quote, Each year, he, Strong, explains his background to the when telling of the novel's plot, the World Economic Forum convenes in Davos, Switzerland. Over a thousand CEOs, prime ministers, finance ministers, and leading academics gather in February to attend meetings and set economic agendas for the year ahead. With this as a setting, Ethan says, what if a small group of these world leaders were to conclude that the principal risk to the earth comes from the actions of the rich countries? And if the world is to survive, those rich countries would have to sign an agreement reducing their impact on the environment. Will they do it? The group's, conclude, uh, the group's conclusion is no. The rich countries won't do it. They won't change. So in order to save the planet, the group decides, is it the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? Unquote. Strong then states that the elites, quote, form a secret society to bring about an economic collapse, unquote. 
At this point in the conversation, it was becoming apparent to Wood that Strong was casting himself and other members of the power elite as members of the proposed novel's secret society. Strong continued with his tale, quote, It's February. They're all at Davos. These aren't terrorists. They're world leaders. They have positioned themselves in the world's commodity.